today we are going to talk about the lumbar puncture how to perform the lumbar puncture as all of you are knowing that it is now and then being performed in the hospitals for patients who come with meningitis meningitis right and we have to make the diagnosis and i welcome you all you have been always very supportive right so maybe this is my last class with you so i wanted that uh, that that we contribute something and uh, upload this and show it to others who can learn from this procedure so will you please uh, show us how to do the lumbar puncture uh, if you wish you can introduce yourself so that we, you can introduce yourself yes uh, okay so hi i'm uh surely i'm a fine hair medical student so today we're going shadow to house uh, yeah, shadow house manager shadow house manager okay shadow house manager program uh today we'll be performing a procedure known as a uh, lumbar puncture and uh it will involve me in uh, introducing a needle into the spine just to extract some uh, fluid from uh, to help me aid the diagnosis for this condition um you have to sign a consent form if it's okay okay so then uh the procedure is done in a septic uh space septic uh room and the position of the patient should be in lateral recumbent position so before before we before we position the patient we have to take the consent as you already you, you have to take the consent from the patient you have to introduce yourself to the patient and you have to tell that why you are performing this procedure what are the benefits and adverse effects of this procedure and when the patient gives you the consent then you can proceed for doing this procedure yes okay. so positioning of the patient already then uh, next is i'll have to go and prepare the instruments and uh, ready to uh, scrub in and perform the procedure uh, prior to that we have to do a surface marking which will be from uh, localizing the the first of all you have to you have to you have to wash your hands right you have to clean your hands you have to wear the the apron you have to wear the face mask face mask then you can wear the cap the and 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 if 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 the patient is very infected sometimes the patient is the the aids patients come and then you may wear the protective glasses so that any splash or it doesn't come which can which can go into the eye and can cause the problems right so once that is done so so you can wear the gloves and all that then you you maintain the privacy of the patient right so take him in the room where the where the this procedure is to be done maintaining his privacy then you have to you have to do a proper positioning of the patient and you can if patient is you can be get a shuttle or there will be definitely in the hospital there will be nurses and paramedical staff so they can assist you and positioning of the patient to so how to do positioning of the patient so ask the patient to be at the so will you please speak loudly because oh. yes so, uh, what are you doing make sure the patient's lying on the lateral recumbent and at the edge of the bed so you have to bring the patient at the edge of the bed right and the the, the patient is to be curled up curled up means that thigh should be against the abdomen and chin should be against the chest so that the spinous processes become very prominent so once they are prominent then you start start the feeling the spinous process right yes. so our anatomical landmark would be the posterior surface of the iliac crest so it will be the 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 you have to take first the highest point the highest uh, highest. highest point of the iliac crest so from the highest point of iliac crest you will draw a perpendicular line across the spine yes so that will that will pass through l4 or third and fourth space or l4 space it will it will pass right yes 
and the and the space will be which space we will introduce the needle it will be third and third and fourth space okay then carry on so you have marked the area right yes then Pencils, the pencil, and mark the area. Okay. And after that, we have to clean the area. So you will be cleaning the area, yes. right? With the chlorhexidine or or the betadine, right? Yes. So you soak the gauze or you soak the cotton, and you start cleaning it from inwards to outwards. A larger area is to be cleaned. Yes, you can clean it. Can start cleaning a little faster. Yes. So you can you, you can clean it. You can clean it for about one minute. You understand the point? Or you can clean it for about two minutes till you are very much satisfied. Or you can clean it twice. Even thrice can clean. You should be very much satisfied that it has been cleaned properly. So once antiseptic cleaning has been done, then we will treat. So you will drive the patient. Yes. So you can drive the patient. So patient is drafted. Only the area in which we need to access is 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 uncovered. Rest is all covered. Right? Yes. Yes. Then. So, so you you want to anesthetize the patient, patient, so you will take around one or two percent of xylogate, around around five mL. Yes, done, done, done. Yes, so it is taken right, and then you insert the needle at the marked area. Feel the spinous processes, and it should be it should be exactly at the midline. You understand the point? Yes. And then introduce it in all the four directions. Yes, like this. Then other side, and yes. Then other side, yes. And then you can you can you can introduce it deeper and deeper. Right? Yes. And and once it is done, once it is done, you will wait for one or two minutes. So after waiting for one or two minutes, you will check whether it is whether it is anesthetized or not. So you can check it by giving a giving a prick. Needle, yes. So you ask the patient, do you feel? Do you feel? The patient says, no, I don't feel. It means it is anesthetized, isn't it? Yes. It means it is anesthetized. And and once it is anesthetized, then you introduce the lumbar puncture needle. So lumbar puncture needle in adult, it has got different sizes. So in the in the children, it will be smaller. In infants, very much smaller, and in adults, it will be a, a big size, isn't it? So it is around 8.9 centimeters, right? Or some may be 9 to 10 centimeters, right? And when you are trying to introduce the introduce the needle, it is to be introduced between the spinous process of third and fourth lumbar vertebra. And needle should be perpendicular to the spine, and you move deeper, go deeper and deeper. Yes, and bevel should be upwards. The bevel means the opening. The opening of the needle should be upwards. Yes, please. The lumbar puncture needle will have stellar process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So stellar process is. In the in the needle and then you introduce it. And once you introduce it, you will get a sensation of giving away. The resistance will be lost at some point when you go deeper. So meaning that 
the needle is in the subarachnoid space. And once you feel that it is in the subarachnoid space, you take out the stylet process and see if the if the fluid comes out, if the drops come out. If it if it if it doesn't come out, then you can try again. You understand? Me? If you feel that yes, it is coming, so. So once it is coming, so first of all, you yes, you can put a three-way stop cock like this, and you take the manometer and measure the CSF pressure. You understand? Yes. yes. And once that has been done, then you will collect the CSF in four test tubes. You understand? Yes. So one test tube will be for the biochemistry. The second will be for the histopathology, the third will be for culture and sensitivity, and fourth will be a reserve one. And around around three to four ml of CSF in each test tube you can take. You understand me? And once procedure has been, once it has been taken, the samples have been taken, then you will take out the, you can again put the standard process and take out the lumbar puncture needle. And you can soak again the the gauze or the or the cotton, right? You can soak it with little bit of uh, betadine or chlorhexidine, then put it on the puncture side, right? And press it for some time and put a adhesive over it. You got my point? So that is how we do the how we do the procedure of number puncture. Now my question is, my question to you is, how many ml maximum you can take out? Okay, how many ml are formed in 24 hours? CSF. 500 ml. Yes, so in 24 hours it is 500 ml the CSF is formed. You understand me? So from the 500 ml for example, even if you take 50 ml, it is, the patient is not going to go into danger or anything. But if you take more than 50, then it is dangerous. You understand me? The maximum you can take 50 ml. But we don't need 50 ml. We only need, need 10, 12 ml we need. You understand me? And and what are the indications of the lumbar puncture? Infection. The infection of the indications of lumbar puncture is infection of the meninges. You understand the point? So menin meninges. We have to we have to make the accurate diagnosis why there is infection of the meninges. And we know that infection of meninges meninges can happen due to viral infection, bacterial infection, rickettsial infection, fungal infection, isn't it? So when we when we take out the spinal fluid, then we will send it for culture and find out which organism is responsible for the meningitis. What are the other indications? The other indications are if, if you have to give any therapeutic drug. You, if you wish, you want that drug should directly go to CNS. Then this is the rule. In certain malignancies and all that, you take this rule and give drug through the CSF. You understand? Yes. It reaches directly bypassing all the roads. What are the other indications? The other indication is if somebody has to go for cesarean uh, section or somebody has to go to spinal anesthesia and delivery, then you can do, do, do this. Any other? Like? Like? Yes. I want to ask you, can we can we do the lumbar puncture in raised intracranial pressure? No. no. All of you say in one voice, no. No. Yes. Maybe not. <laughs> there is a one condition where you can do in raised intracranial pressure. You must have never heard it, isn't it? 
that is called benign raised intracranial pressure. The, the problem of the patient will be that his main problem will be, will be because of raised intracranial pressure. Too much CSF is formed or pressure is increasing too much because of CSF production. We call it as benign raised intracranial pressure. Some people have this disease. And that can only be relieved when you decompress, when you take CSF, CSF some of the CSF you take off. So it becomes an indication there. The rest, all other raised intracranial pressures are <coughs> intraindicated. You understand? Mm -hmm. My question to you is, you have done this lumbar puncture, isn't it? And suppose your test tube falls down, right, and it breaks. Or you send the specimen to the laboratory, laboratory people say, oh, it is not, something has gone wrong, it is not accurate, you understand the point? Then will you do again? Say so. If you don't do again, the patient is going to die, isn't it? You, you are not going to make a diagnosis. So there is no hard and fast rule. Most of you know that we should not do repeatedly, repeatedly lumbar puncture. Under such conditions, you have to do it. You can do a lumbar puncture if it is needed. You understand the point? If it is needed, suppose the laboratory people send you back the sample telling you, oh, this is not, in, this is inaccurate, something has gone wrong, please send another sample, then do again the lumbar puncture and send the sample. Or it has broken, do again. And another thing is that sometimes you give the treatment. There's some, some people have got meningeal and capillates, right? And you are giving some treatment and treatment patient is not responding. Then how will you know whether the cells in the, in the CSF have come down or not? You understand and implement the cells. Then you have to do the CSF and you have to find out whether whether the inflammatory cells and in CSF have decreased in number or it is increasing or it is still the same. If it is increasing or still the same, it means your antib antibiotic is not working properly. You have to change the disease. Yeah, you understand the point? So to know the progress in such cases, you can do the you can repeat the CSF. So, and under some conditions, you can do it. There is nothing that you shouldn't do it. But what is what you have to keep it in mind that you don't have to do it more repeatedly. You don't have to do it many times. You understand my point? Yes. Under some conditions, if you do it two, three times, no problem. But don't think that 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 because if you do too much of too much needling in the area, then skin is going to die get damaged, isn't it? Tissue is going to get damaged. Or it may it may it may cause the, the, the roots of the spinal cord may get damaged or spinal cord itself may get damaged. That is why we don't allow the repetition of my another question to you is how much is the CSF pressure? Because first we have to we have to measure by nanometer, isn't it? So how much is CSF pressure? Any, anyone say something? You must have done in the hospitals, you must have seen the procedures, isn't it? So it is around, the, it should be up to 20, 20, 20 centimeters of water. You see, we measure the CSF in centimeters of water. That we are saying that maximum should be, it should not be more than 20. If it is more than 20 centimeters of water, then we say CSF is raised. Do you understand the point? What are the adverse effects of lumbar puncture? The most yes, the most important side effect is post lumbar puncture headache, and it can be relieved by giving a by giving a paracetamol. And under such conditions, you have to ask the patient to lie or or, or lie rested over the belly. He has to be on the prone position, at least for half an hour. And gives paracetamol and after half an hour he can take whatever position he wants. That is how we relieve it. The other effects will be the infection. We may introduce the infection. If it is not cleaned properly, equipment is not set properly, then you may you may you may introduce the infection. You understand the point? 
or if there is an infection at the site and you are you are doing some some rash is there or infection is there and you are doing this thing then you may introduce this hydrogenic you may introduce the infection so at that time that it is, it is also contraindicated the other as i said the adverse effect will be the hemorrhage the, the bleeding may take place or it may injure the roots causing radiculopathy that along that route there will be numbness or there will be paresthesia or abnormal sensation or it may damage the it may damage the spinal cord sometimes that we may not be able to withdraw the fluid then you have to go one space down or one space up if still you don't if you still don't get the csf what could be the what could be the condition the condition could be that patient may have obstruction in the spinal cord you understand the point a tumor may be there which is obstructing so that the csf doesn't come down you got my point what are the other other adverse effects the other adverse the the or what are the contraindications the contraindication is if there is a cellulitis or there is a deformity the spine is deformed suppose spine vertebra is deformed then you would be able to do or if there is infection is or if there is a bleeding tendencies in the patient some patients have got thrombocytopenia or some people have got coagulation factor defects and if when you start uh injecting the needle in them slight bleed will continue bleed and it will be difficult for you to arrest this bleed so you have to first check that patient doesn't have any bleeding disorder you said that right then do the number two. you understand the point yes any other contraindication previous lumbar surgery yes any other contraindication The other contraindication, as we said, is the raised intracranial pressure. Now, my question to you is: Suppose you are in the hospital setting, there is MRI also, isn't it? Yes. And and you are asked to do the lumbar puncture. So, asked to do the lumbar puncture. What would you prefer first, the the CT scan or MRI, or you will prefer the you will prefer the lumbar puncture? the ideal is that you take first the ct scan or mr it will tell you it will give you the diagnosis if there is such a problem that there may be a, there may be a tumor right or it will tell you whether there is raised intracranial pressure or not if you find it is there then you need not to do the lumbar puncture because this is an invasive procedure so under such setting is anyone who has to go for lumbar puncture it is better that if that facility is available to be get it done ct scan of the brain if yes that it is not conclusive and it is to be needed to do the lumbar puncture then you do the lumbar we got the point is that clear yes any questions any questions no question Any questions? All, all, all done. Yes. So I, I thank you all. Right, I thank you all for your patience of listening. Very, uh, you are very attentive. Right, and I hope, I hope that that message has been passed to you. Is it? So you have to practice this when you are tomorrow when you are working in the hospital. You are already working in the hospital, so just keep these things in in mind, right? So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank so thank I also thank Tramoti, right? Who was our who was our camera operator? <laughs> You have done a very good job. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for your contribution. <laughs>